One of the most beloved and yet most difficult books in the entirety of the Hebrew Bible is the book of Job. It has been the source of innumerable artistic renderings, plays, books that have tried to taken up its themes and its story. But for those of us who are scholars, it is, I mean, it's borderline impossible to read in, in, the, in the Hebrew. Yeah. And it is, uh, it's, often, it's almost impossible to read just because it goes on and on and on and gets repetitive. But its themes and its, uh, the central question it grapples with seem to be so uh, central and, and, yeah. and so familiar. Where, where does this book come from? Yeah. You know, uh, first of all, the Greek translation is a good deal shorter. And in many cases, when a Greek version of a biblical book is shorter, it's because they had a shorter Hebrew text. In the case of Job, I think they just said, we've said that. <laughs> it's, just, it's just better edited. It, it, it's just, <laughs> yes. So, so read the Greek. <laughs> it helps. Now, um, where does it come from? Well, here at the beginning, we're told there was a man in the land of Uz, whose name was Job. Where's the land of Uz? Not. It, it, I mean, well, <laughs> you know, it, uh, there's, it's, it's, it has, has this very odd, this is odd semi-fictional, semi semi-mythological semi setting. I mean, it's, you know, it, if there is a land of, nobody in Israel knew where it was. <laughs> nobody, uh, right? so, so the main point is this is not in Israel. Right. Is there uh, any, well, there are books about Jewish exiles in Babylon and then Persia later on, but that there is uh, nothing, you know, who, that is so resolutely uh, Yeah, I mean, you know, it's, 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 it, it might as well simply say, this story does not take place, like, in, in a land far away. In a land far away. But now, also, also, but when? As, as to when, yeah. Because tr the traditional, too. you know, the traditional Jewish uh, uh, if you look at the Talmud, this is a book that, is, that Moses is said to have written. Moses wrote the yeah. Torah and, and the book of Job. And in fact, they, they sometimes write it you know, in, in, uh, in Paleo-Hebrew, I think. In, yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, so, and yet, <coughs> I think neither one of us thinks that it's a particularly old book. No, no, you have two elements in it which complicate the thing. You have a folktale. This is where we get the famous patience of Job. Right. And you have that at the beginning and at the end. Uh -huh. And then, you have long poetic dialogues in between where Job seems to be a completely different kind of character. Right, that's more the patience of the reader. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> now, uh, I would, so I guess the first question is which of these comes first? And my guess is that the folktale comes first, that there was a story. Now, when was this story? Uh, probably by the time of the Babylonian exile or maybe way earlier, about uh, that this man who was beset with all sorts of problems and remained patient. Yeah. And then what we really call the Book of Job, I think, is made by the poet who inserts into the middle of it all these poetic dialogues. Yeah, so I guess my, my question is, do you think that the frame folktale, the version that we have of it, is actually very old, or is this... Right, is, you know, are we talking about like a very early text that has been, in, yeah. you know, something's been inserted in, or is it? Can we say it's an old story, yeah. but this is a later? Yeah, I take of it, it that it's an old story. Yeah, because I think the the prose as we have it is styled to fit the poetry. Agreed. And especially in the conclusion, I think. Right. The conclusion would make no sense now if you hadn't read the poems. Right. But we can, we but, can say we, uh, with some certainty <coughs> that at least the, the traditional figure of Job right, must have been a relatively, relatively early one. Right? Yeah. Ezekiel famously right, refers to Job and, and Daniel. Right? And, and Noah. And Noah, right? As, you know, as sort of these, that kind of figure. Right. So, uh, yeah. But that's the, antiquity. But that's the only other reference to... Yeah. Now, uh, so what people look at then would be the language of the poetry. Uh, some people have compared that to Second Isaiah. I'm not sure. You know, there's a good deal of mythology that comes up in the language. Yeah, Leviathan and Rahab yeah. and that sort of stuff. The late Mitchell de Hood used to say, 
this was written in Tyre or Sidon somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> right. not, not Israelites at all, but they don't think anybody. Well, but I mean, part of the that. reason to think that is because the language of the book, again, the Hebrew, I remember it being, it being suggested to me when I was in school uh, that the language of the book was written to invoke the foreignness of it, right? The Hebrew is, is so weird and at times seemingly bad that it must be intentional, right? This is not Israelite, right? It's like, it's like as if it were written in sort of, sort of, some sort of patois, right? Like a, um, like yeah. a, a creole. I'm not sure I, 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 I buy it, but there is, there is something linguistically weird about, uh, about the book. It was certainly preserved so that we would have something to teach in courses on advanced Hebrew. Right, or even beyond advanced Hebrew. Yes. But let's get to so, the, let's get to the, the, at least the beginning of the, the, this, this folktale, yeah. right? which is really famous. I had the opportunity uh, last semester to uh, be teaching a course down at the Rare Book Library where we looked at this beautiful Hebrew manuscript that had an image of Job sort of sitting on his dung pile with his boils and his friends standing there scolding him. This terribly unhappy image surrounded by all this gold, uh, gold leaf, which felt very uh, sort of, you know, very disconnected. <laughs> uh, uh, but the, yeah. but the, that part of the story, right, this notion of this, uh, th this guy who is getting everything taken away from him seemingly for nothing is in enormously famous and is, is taken, I think that's where we get the association largely of, of, of this book and, and the wisdom literature, right? It, it goes directly to the question of, you know, why do bad things happen to good people? And yeah. since Job is by all accounts as righteous as could possibly be, then the author of Job is saying, essentially saying to conventional wisdom as we get in the book of Proverbs, so here's a guy who yeah. did everything right and it all got taken away from him. But at the beginning, he's depicted as a conventionally, perfectly righteous person. Yeah. Down to the point of being, uh, rather of overdoing it, <laughs> you might say, offering sacrifice in case they sinned with their heart. So what goes wrong? Why, why in fact, does he lose everything? This is the, uh, this is the moment where the figure of Hasatan really comes into its own in, in the yes. Hebrew Bible. Uh, obviously becomes a Satan in later tradition, but in, uh, at this point is still the, the Satan, the Satan, yep. which is to say the adversary, right? This the is, adversary. This he, is the either prosecuting attorney or muckraker. Right, or, or you know, often, oftentimes both. Special, uh, special prosecutor. Right, <laughs> <laughs> that, 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 that's exactly Poking what it is. Poking around to see what he can find. Right. And then, and you know, it, it, it's essentially, it's, it's a bet, right? And, and this yep. is, it's, it's so painful, right? To, to, to think that this, this man's life or any person's life can be, you know, tossed about because God is uh, feeling whimsical, right? Want, yep. Wants to see how things are going. It's a great line in Robert Frost's Mask of Reason, which is one of the, the literary adaptations where at the end, God comes back to visit Job, and Job says, I mean, now that it's all over, why? why? And God says, I was just showing off to the devil. Now, that's pretty close to that's, the... I think that's, exact, that's exactly what it's saying. Of course, that says something about sort of the value of human life. <laughs> you know, it's, well, it uh, does, and it's a chilling uh, view of God, mm -hmm. in a way. Now, one of the things we'll find in this book is that Life is not all about us. It's not all about human beings. We are not at the center of the universe here. Sure. And in fact, we're incidental, disposable. Now, yeah. and the, the merits of Job have absolutely nothing to do with it. Right, the merits of Job as a person. As a person. Right. Yeah. Um, so his, I mean, what hap what the things that befall him is just the, you know, sort of unbelievable sequence of Terrible, right? He has one really bad day. Yeah, right. But it is, Terrible you know, awful. one thing after another. It's, you know, <laughs> his, his wealth yeah. and, his, and his family and, all, you know, his wife and his children, right, all just, you know, one after another being taken away from him and his health, right, so that he's, he's sort of reduced to, as I said, sort of sitting on a dunghill, scrape, scraping his boils. Yeah. Now, does he remain patient? 
he's patient enough to wait through the 30 chapters of his, friends, <laughs> of his friends yelling at him. Well, um, yeah, in the prose part of it here, you know, he's, um, he, he's holding up great until what cracks him really is when his friends show up. Yeah, yeah, you know, and there's, there's a sense in which right, the, 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 the test of, the initial test from, from the adversary, from, from Hasatan, which is if I take everything away, I, he will curse God, clearly does not work. Yeah. Right? That clear, and that's established yeah. very early, as they keep taking things away, and Job at, at no point start, comes to curse God. But his patience does run out. It's just his patience well, with others. But, but also, uh, Satan sees something here that flesh for flesh, you know, and, and our skin for skin, all that people have, they will give to save their lives. Now, touch himself. Yeah. So that's part, of, even that doesn't initially do it. It's when his friends come and see him from a distance and then raised their voices, wept aloud, tore their robes, threw dust in the air upon their heads, and sat with them on the ground seven days and seven nights, and no one spoke a word. You can hardly blame the poor man if he lost his patience after that. <laughs> when they do start talking, his friends, uh, what they communicate to him is, you know, they're, they're, not on, they're not on Satan's side, but they, they are trying, like Satan, they're trying to provoke a particular reaction from him, right? Yeah. And in a sense, what they're invoking, each in its own way, is, is, is that sort of conventional proverbial wisdom of, if, you're, if your life looks like this, something terrible, you know, yeah. you must have done something. And, you know, it's interesting to see there's at least some progression in the friends when a life as the Tamanite is the first one to speak. And he's very polite uh -huh. and ingratiating. Uh, if one ventures a word with you, will you be offended? You have instructed many. You're a great guy, Joel, Job. But, <laughs> but, <laughs> but, uh, but now think, who that was innocent ever perished? Or where were the upright cut off? I have seen those who plow iniquity and sow trouble reach, uh, reap the same. Yeah, I mean, so, what world was this person living in? Whereas, who's ever seen anybody righteous suffer? It clearly, it, it, it clearly not written in Israel, right? <laughs> um, I mean, this is, it, it is, it's like, it's like a fairy tale yeah. sort, of, sort of land. But now, I mean, this fairy tale was maintained pretty well in traditional wisdom like we get in the book of Proverbs, which will say, you know, that God never lets the righteous suffer. And so the premise of, uh, of Eliphaz is, Job, you must have done yeah, exactly. something. Now, think about it. Nobody's perfect. Uh, I'm not saying you're a terrible sinner, but you must have done something. And if you confess that, then God will forgive you and you'll be restored and everything will be fine. Yeah, and so, and so, the, and so, so, the, and, and so it, yeah. Eliphaz doesn't have the knowledge that we do as readers, that Job is in fact that perfect, right? So, there, there, yeah. but so the, it, it's, a, it's a speech that for, from his perspective sort of invokes that kind of traditional perspective. But our, our, our response as readers is, is, is no, no, that's not quite right, right, what, what he's saying. I mean, it's crucial, actually, to the book that uh, Job and his friends are not privy to the first two chapters, that, I mean, to the, the scene in heaven. Right. They don't know anything about this. Uh, there was a rewriting of this book sometime in late antiquity called The Testament of Job, which actually has God tell Job at the beginning. Yeah. Now, I'm going to test you. Well, if you know that you're going to be tested, that's a whole different ballgame. Right. If you know what's going on. Right. But here, you don't. 